We live in a confused culture of young men and women who really don't know who they are or why they are here. They lack purpose, they lack meaning, they live by the demands of their own selfish amb ambitions and the dictates of the zeitgeist. They believe they've evolved from slime by accident and yet they have the moral sensibilities of a 17th century Puritan. Of course, this morality is just a cocktail of cultural forces with no underlying consistency at all. If you are accidentally evolved from slime, why does it matter if you act like a slime ball? Why the moral indignation if this slime ball thinks that, that the color of his slime is better than the color of somebody else's slime? What differentiates a genocide in Rwanda from cutting the grass on a Saturday afternoon? If a school bus runs into a tree and children die, are we to lament the death of the children and not the tree? Why? Or what about the damaged metal of the bus? Why are these things different? The attempts to rid ourselves of God are really quite remarkable and only lead to a schizophrenic society which suppresses the obvious truth with more and more unrighteousness. As Paul says in Romans, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. We're made in the image of our creator, and yet that image is marred, and when we fail to be godlike, we fail to be perfect, as God is perfect. And while this is lamentable, it also makes sense of a world gone mad. It makes reality intelligible. We know who we are. We know why we're here. We know when we are not as we are supposed to be. And the underlying consistency is that we are made in the image and likeness of our Father, the creator of all things. This reminds us of our need to repent and confess. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. Amen. Come to the part in our service where... God ministers to his people through his word. So uh, please stand for the reading of God's word. In the beginning created, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. 
So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth, across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures, and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird, according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and the beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth. And every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his works, which God had created and made. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Last week, we talked about the entire book of Genesis. We saw that it's a book of origin stories, a book of beginnings, of ancestry, and identity. We flew overhead at about 30,000 feet and viewed its terrain, but now we're making our landing in chapter 1 and a little bit into chapter 2. Chapter divisions are artificial, came thousands of years later. The story naturally breaks about three verses into chapter 2, or the accounting, the first accounting of uh, of uh, the creation week. This is the beginning of the book of the beginnings. It's the beginning of all of history. Here we're told that God created the heavens and the earth, and that the earth was formless and void. And the first week is the creator giving the earth form and filling that void. It's the essential problem of creation. It's not really a problem. God created it that way. But then he labors for the rest of the week remedying that problem. He gives the earth form by dividing, separating, and making distinctions. He creates light and dark, day and night, evening and morning. He divides the waters above and below the firmament, sea and land. In Melville's Moby Dick, there's a line where he says, there's no quality in this world that is not what it is merely by contrast. You know what warmth is because you know what cold is. You know what wet is because you know what dry is. Creation is what it is because this is not that, and that is not this. Subjects and objects create the concept of otherness. Everything is not one, despite what the Hindu Vedas say. There is a creator, and there is his creation. And within that creation are distinctions. And after God makes some of these basic distinctions and, and gives form to the formlessness, he begins to fill those forms with grass and trees, sun, moon, stars, fish, birds, insects, reptiles, cattle, beasts, and finally, humanity. 
the crown of his creation, the image bearers of the creator. Image bearers of God, a God who created a world which still holds us in awe and wonder 6,000 years later. A world which has millions of viewers watching the Discovery Channel and Shark Week and Nova and Humans Are Awesome videos on YouTube. A world with quantum physics and hurricanes, swans and spiders, Niagara Falls and the Hubble Telescope. And then he creates a being which is made in his own likeness. Perhaps as one commentator put it, there were angels watching and thinking to themselves, what are these image bearers of God capable of? Man is capable of creation. He is created to create. He is a creator or a sub-creator, to borrow a term from J.R.R. Tolkien. Like our creator, we create worlds with our spoken words. We speak worlds into existence. Tolkien had in mind our ability to create stories, fantasy worlds, fairy tales, and he had a firm grasp of how important this was. And this truly is incredible. Anybody who loves literature knows the power and magic of well-crafted narrative, of compelling characters, and perfectly chosen words. And yet this is only part of our sub-creational powers, our sub-creational faculties, our image-bearing responsibilities. We speak words of edification and spirits are lifted. We speak words of rebuke and souls are turned from death. We speak curses and souls are embittered. We say, I love you and a child is born. A life is created. We say, I hate you and we murder in our hearts. A life is taken away. We preach the gospel and men die and resurrect. Life and death is in the power of the tongue, as the Proverbs tell us. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The words, the words which proceed from our tongues ought to be carefully weighed and seriously considered. But, as James tells us, no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brothers, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Paul tells the Ephesians, and he goes on to say, Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or crude joking, which are out of character, but rather thanksgiving. John the Baptist and Jesus say, You brood of vipers, how can you, who are evil, say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. And that's really the issue, isn't it? We need a new heart. We need a heart of flesh so that our world-creating words will be life-giving and reflect God's goodness and his righteousness. And we have to keep these things in mind because, Christ says, on the day of judgment, everyone will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Plato, in his famous book, The Republic, bans the poets from the perfect city because the power of poetry and music making created instability within the laws of the city. He essentially believed that the artists had legislative power, that they were the congressmen of the city, that the poet, the musician, was able to more readily sway the minds of men and therefore change the laws of the city. And this is very interesting. One of the purposes God creates man is to have dominion over the earth and to fill it. We are told this explicitly in Genesis 1, what we just read. Man is created to imitate what God had just accomplished in creation. This dominion mandate is recast in the Great Commission. And we are not only tending to a garden now, but we are tending to a garden city, a new Jerusalem, the city of God. And in the city of God, we exercise dominion over the city of man with our words. 
In the city of God, Christians are called to be poets because poets destroy cities. Poets legislate laws. Poets bring joy to the Lord. Paul tells us to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. This is why in our service we speak to each other in the responsive readings where we say psalms to each other. We are obeying Paul's commands here. We are disrupting the laws of the city of man and displacing them with the laws of the city of God. Psalm 95, 2, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Paul says to the Colossians, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. In this way, we exercise the dominion mandate. We march forward in this warfare of worship, not only on the Lord's day, but on every day, because every day is the Lord's. We set aside Sunday to ascend into the heavenlies and worship together with the angels and archangels and to break bread with each other, because that is what is modeled for us in the New Testament. But it's also a token of dedication to God, like our financial tithe, which says all of our resources are yours. Every day is yours. All of life is yours. All of creation is yours. And so we move forward, exercising our dominion over the earth as warrior poets, constantly at war with the flesh, the enemies of God, the city of man, the old man, and the old creation. After God created mankind, he says to the male and the female, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. With the full counsel of scripture available to us, I believe this can be more than biological procreation. Though it certainly does mean that, having children is a blessing and Christian marriages ought to be fruitful and multiply in this sense Christians ought to be having biological children, many biological children. But you're not disobeying the dominion mandate by not having biological children. But you can still be disobeying the dominion mandate if you're not having children. What do I mean? Well, Paul was single and didn't have any biological children. And Christ, the perfect man, never married nor had any biological children. So how are they able to be fruitful and multiply? Well, by having spiritual children. Paul refers to Timothy, Titus, Onesimus, and all the saints of Corinth and Galatia as either his children or his sons. Perhaps one of his statements to the Corinthians is the most instructive to our purposes here. He says, I do not write this to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And this, by the way, is um, one of the reasons why uh, Catholic priests are often called father, or maybe even Lutheran or Anglican priests. It's not wrong to call someone who's a spiritual father your father. <laughs> um, similarly, Peter refers to Mark as his son. John refers to the recipients of his letters as his children. Job is called a father to the needy. God makes Joseph a father to Pharaoh. God makes uh, Eliakim a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. All of these demonstrate some form of spiritual fatherhood, fatherly wisdom, counsel, or provision by God's people to others who need it. And so I believe that this is the fullest sense of what it means to be fruitful and multiply, to produce these new men, to multiply and fill the earth with this new kind of humanity, these new covenant children, these supernatural, superhuman, supermen. The inverse of this is that it is possible to have biological children and to cause them to become spiritually dead. 
And so one must raise their biological children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, just as the single person fathers their mother's spiritual children to maturity. A biological father or mother must attend to the spiritual maturation of their children and cling to the covenantal promises given to us in baptism. God's promise is to you and your children, as Peter tells the men at Pentecost. God fathers humanity. He creates sons and daughters, and we participate in that paternal and maternal creative function as image bearers of the Father, God, or the Mother, His church, which is His body. The last thing I want to mention uh, briefly concerning our dominion as image bearers of God is related to the Great Commission. I made an allusion to this earlier, and I'm not going to get into this in detail, but I, I simply just want to point out that the dominion mandate in Genesis gives God's humanity uh, dominion over every living thing that moves on the earth. I think it's pretty clear that this would include other humans. And of course, this doesn't mean uh, it's the kind of dominion that is miserable and coercive, like a slave driver, but it's the kind of dominion that the Lord has over the lives of his people, which is ultimately freeing. And the, the, the main point that I want to address is that um, the animals in the creation account um, and throughout scripture, I believe, symbolize men. One of the things that I noticed actually when we were just reading it is that the blessing or command, depending on how you want to take it, to be fruitful and multiply isn't first given to uh, Adam and Eve, but it's actually given to the animals, the fish, the birds. They're told the exact same thing as Adam and Eve, so there's already their uh, parallel. Um, but Adam and Eve, or humanity, are given the, uh, the be fruitful, multiply, and the dominion mandate. Perhaps uh, one of the most obvious examples uh, in Scripture is the sacrificial system un under Moses. The entire system of animal sacrifice symbolizes a man, or the God-man, Christ. Whenever we lay hands on someone to make them an elder or bless them or pray for them, we're actually recalling the ritualized actions of the Levites and the animal sacrifices who would place their hands on the head of the lamb, ram, goat, or bull, and then they would offer them in sacrifice to the Lord. So when we lay our hands on another human, we are liturgically or symbolically saying, this person whom I have laid my hands upon is to be a sacrifice to the Lord. There's a connection between the animal sacrifices in the Mosaic dispensation and what we do now with the laying on of hands. And Hebrews tells us specifically that the, the sacrifices all pointed to Christ. David likens himself to a sheep in Psalm 23 when he says that the Lord is his, is his shepherd. Jesus likens men to fish when he says he is going to make his disciples fishers of men. And interestingly enough, Habakkuk, when he's referring to uh, the Babylonian um, capture of Israel and Jerusalem, he refers to Babylonians as fishers of men. <laughs> he says, why do you, meaning God, make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They, meaning the Babylonians, take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. So in the conquest of uh, the ungodly pagans over the ungodly covenant people, Habakkuk likens the relationship to that of fishermen and fish, ruler and ruled. As godly covenant people, the relationship uh, will be reversed. We are to be the rulers and they are, to, they are uh, uh, to be ruled. But my main point here is that the creation account in Genesis 1 is teeming with animal life, and I believe we're invited to see this as more than simply literal animal life, but as human life. Dominion over all creation uh, means discipling of the nations. The old creation anticipates things about the new creation. Consider these words in verse 1. In the beginning. That's, that's what's there in verse 1. In the beginning. Where else do we see these used? Well, it's verse 1 
chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The language that John uses intentionally recalls the language that Moses uses at the beginning of Genesis. As an aside, traditionally the church has taught uh, Moses to be the author of Genesis. Others believe uh, it was written much later, uh, usually in the Babylonian exile, or compiled over several years where its final composition came in the exile and it was many different authors. Still others believe that it, it's, it could have been Joseph, actually, who wrote the Genesis account. Um, I actually think that there's good reason to believe it was Joseph, but uh, we'll stick with the traditional understanding um, and uh, we'll go with Moses since we're all about, uh, as Tevia would say, tradition. Tradition. Um, in the beginning is meant to make the hearer think about the creation of the world and that the God who created the world became a man, the Christ. And Christ himself refers to the beginning a few times during his ministry. He talks about the glory that he had with the Father uh, before um, the foundations of the world, which I guess is an allusion to the beginning without actually explicitly saying. But one of the times that he references beginning, he doesn't say in the beginning, but he says uh, beginning, <laughs> is uh, in reference to the marriage of Adam and Eve in Matthew 19. And I bring this up because... Christians who want to be respected by their peers at the cool kid table of academia have tried to invent a synthesis between zeitgeist old earth mythologies and the young earth creational mythology of scripture. There are, there's a variety of different ways they do this, a variety of theories with different names, the gap theory, the day-age theory, the framework hypothesis, theistic evolution, and so on and so on and so on. Gap theory places billions of years between verse 1 and 2. Day-age theory just says that each day corresponds to long geological eras. Framework hypothesis believes that some form of the account is poetic or allegorical rather than historical. Theistic evolution just says that God oversaw the evolutionary process in more of a deistic kind of manner. manner. There are plenty of problems with each of these, both scientifically and theolog uh, theologically. But what I want to bring up is Jesus' use of the term beginning in reference to Adam and Eve. And it's simply this. It seems to be very unnatural to refer to the time of Adam and Eve as the beginning if most of history, 14 billion years, according to the Nacho Libre Atheist, went by before the first humans arrive on the scene very late in the game, about seven to uh, about five to seven million years ago, Matthew nineteen four. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Well, it seems odd to refer to it as the beginning if really Adam and Eve come on the scene about fourteen billion years later. Essentially, it's a it's a strange illusion um, to to say that the universe had existed for fourteen billion years, 13 billion years, and then Adam and Eve uh, appear. That really humanity is on the tail end of this story. So Jesus believed Adam and Eve existed in the beginning, and so should we. Uh, allow me to briefly touch on a couple more issues with these uh, competing theories. To believe that the world existed for billions of years with lower forms of life evolving into more complex and fit organisms is to say that the world was uh, red in tooth and claw prior to Adam and Eve. In other words, death was part of the created order prior to Adam's sin. But scripture tells us otherwise. It tells us this is not what happened. We are told that death came in only after Adam's sin and only through Adam. Romans 5.12, therefore just as through one man's sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned. To believe that uh, the evolutionary process was occurring billions of years prior to Adam means that we have to believe that death and struggle and bloodshed occurred 
for most of the existence of the universe prior to Adam. It's a theological problem uh, that old earth creationists or uh, old earth um, evolutionary uh, scientists have who, who want to be Christian at the same time. Uh, Day-age theory, to believe that each day is not a literal 24-hour period is to force a very unnatural reading of the text. The word for day in Hebrew is yom, and it usually refers to a literal 24-hour period of time. About 90, 95% of the time, this is what it's talking about. But not always. There are times when yom can mean a period of time or event, like the day of the Lord, referring to a time of judgment. But the days in Genesis are specifically defined and given boundaries consisting of evening and morning. And, and when the Sabbath is instituted later in Exodus, God uses the creation week as the model to imitate for Sabbath rest. Creation week matches our week. Exodus 28 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gate. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So there, there's, there's that difficulty with the creation week matching the pattern that we see here uh, in the institution of the Sabbath. Additionally, there are other Hebrew terms such as olam or yamim rabim, which can mean a long period of time. Sometimes it's translated as forever or uh, many days. Um, so trying to read the days as long eras of time is uh, quite unlikely. So to recap this kind of creation versus evolution uh, discourse. Jesus and Paul, they both treat the creational account as historical and literal. Jesus refers to Adam and Eve as existing in the beginning, which is quite forced within the span of history. Uh, if Adam and Eve are supposed to have appeared uh, basically after 14 billion years. Um, billions of years of natural selection means that death entered the world prior to Adam. And making the days in Genesis long eras goes against the usual use of the word yom there and elsewhere in scripture, especially the institution of the Sabbath and Exodus. These are, these are just biblical and theological issues which present serious challenges to those who have substituted the traditional reading of Genesis for uh, more modern, innovative ones who have attempted this synthesis of uh, Darwinian evolution with scripture. And it's it is uh, in academia, in evangelical academia, it is quite common. I'm pretty sure it's the uh, official teaching of the Catholic Church. William Lane Craig, John Lennox, um, there are respectable evangelical scholars who uh, reject a young earth creation and, and view, uh, they basically affirm both evolution and the biblical account and they make these weird sentences. <clears throat> I said earlier that the old creation anticipate things about the new creation. Another way of saying this is that the creation of the natural world signifies things about the creation of the supernatural world. So if you look closely at the ordering of the days, um, say verse 5, after each day, we're told what? First evening, then morning. So the evening and the morning were the first day. You look at verse 8. Evening and the morning were the second day. Verse 13 is the same thing with the third day. Verse 19, fourth day, and so on and so on. You have this pattern of darkness and light, evening and morning. It's a... Uh, lesser light to greater light pattern of every day where the evening precedes the morning. This cosmic pattern of less light to more light is essentially, it's a creational typology of history. It is the created order teaching us eschatology, teaching us what's going to unfold in history. 
God's people were given the lesser light of the old covenant first, evening first. We were given shadows and types and figures of things to come as if illumined by the moon, and yet the moon only gives us a derivative light, which ultimately comes from the sun. And so with the advent of the Messiah, we were given the sun, the son of God, the greater light of the new covenant. First evening, then morning. First old covenant, and then new covenant. Zacharias, uh, John the Baptist's father, he even refers to Jesus as the sunrise in Luke 1, And Isaiah prophesies of Christ and his church, saying, The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. He is describing the morning of Christ, the dawning of Christ on all men. In the created order, we are invited by God to see these patterns as types or natural prophecies of how redemptive history will play out. It's like God has taken great pleasure in telling his story and plan for humanity in thousands of ways, some of which are obvious and others which are not so obvious, and they require investigation and a serious contemplative posture. So the natural world signifies things about the supernatural world. And when we tackle seemingly bizarre features of the creation account, instead of just dismissing them as false, we're able to penetrate even deeper into the mind of God and how his creation teaches us about his plan for humanity. Evolutionary accounts differ almost at every point in the creation progression, and the evolutionary account matter is simply eternal or comes from nothing apart from an, intelligible, an intelligent creator. In the creation account, matter is created, meaning it has a beginning, and it's created by an intelligent creator God. Evolution says celestial bodies existed prior to the earth. Creation says earth existed prior to celestial bodies. Evolution says the first life forms were sea creatures. Creation says the first life forms were land plants. Evolution places reptiles before birds. Creation places birds before reptiles. Evolution says the sun was Earth's first light. Creation says the sun was not Earth's first light. And it's this particular discrepancy uh, of light and sun that I want to touch on briefly. Um, in verse 3, God speaks the first light into existence. Let there be light, and there was light. This was the first day. In verse 16, God creates the sun and the moon. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. This was the fourth day. Now, the supposed problem here is this. How could there be light on days one through three if there was no sun? This is a serious objection from supposedly really smart men. <laughs> now, the simple answer is that God said, let there be light. And there was light. Humans can create light apart from the sun. It's not that difficult. You flip on any light switch in your home, and you can witness the miracle of light appearing without the sun. But I want to suggest something further about the light on days one, two, and three. I believe this is the first time that we see the fire or the firelight which comes from the Spirit of God. We are told immediately before that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And throughout Scripture, whenever the Spirit of God is present, it is often seen as fire. And what does fire do? It gives off light. God appears to Moses in a fire-burning bush. The Spirit of God leads the Israelites out of Egypt as a night, at night as a pillar of fire. God's presence on the top of Mount Sinai was like fire. The glory of God is accompanied by fire, which comes down from heaven to consume the first sacrifices in the tabernacle and then in Solomon's temple. The presence of God is poured out via the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and manifests as men who are on fire. Hebrews 12, 29 says, our God is a consuming fire. These are just a few examples, but they're the more obvious ones of God's presence being associated with fire or firelight. So I believe that the first firelight, the first light, was God himself, 
the presence of God, the spirit of God hovering over water, bursting into firelight like a cosmic phoenix. And then he invests the sun on day four and the moon with his firelight, whereby they are given responsibility to rule the day and rule the night so that they could rule over the signs and the seasons, days and years. The celestial bodies signify rulership over the earth. This is why the dimming and deconstruction of celestial bodies is associated uh, with apocalyptic language, which really means the destruction of earthly rulers and regimes. Because men too rule over the earth. And so I believe that this seemingly odd quirk of God's light given to these celestial rulers typify God's plan for humanity. God had always planned to make man ruler over the earth and to invest him with God's own firelight, God's own spirit. And this is precisely the only way man can rule as he ought, by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we become as useless as a sun and moon without light. And so, in a sense, Pentecost was day four for humanity. Pentecost was God giving the firelight to humanity to rule over the earth. The created order tells us about the recreated order. So not only do the celestial bodies and the days themselves tell us something about eschatological trajectory, but the end of the week does as well. And perhaps this is the most important. God labors and works for six days, which is interesting in itself. He doesn't just speak and create everything in a second. He creates uh, formless and void earth, and then he creates things out of that. He takes time to do it. He labors over it. That's interesting in itself. But on the seventh day, he rests. This, of course, is the model by which the Sabbath was implemented in the Old Covenant era. Six days you shall labor, and on the seventh you shall rest. The day of rest was ritualized every week by the Israelites. But the idea of rest isn't seen merely in the Sabbath rest under Moses. It's also referenced to entering the promised land. The promised land is referred to as my rest by God. In Psalm 95, 11, God says, So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, talking about the uh, rebellious Israelites who came out of Israel. And in Hebrews 10, Hebrews 4 rather, we're told that all those who believe in Christ by faith Enter that rest. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So, God's rest is our rest. God's rest is our salvation. Our salvation is to enter his rest, which is only done through faithful obedience to not hardening yourself to his word, to listening to his voice. Now, that's interesting in itself, but it gets even more interesting because later in Hebrews, in, at, the, at the end of chapter 4, we're told that Christ, and it's, it's a confusing chapter, but we're told that Christ rests in the same way that God the Father rested from his work of creation. I'll read it. For he, Jesus, who has entered his rest has himself, Jesus, also ceased from his works as God did from his. So what's going on here is that Christ's work of creating a new world was finished when he resurrected and ascended into heaven, where he is now resting at the right hand of the Father. So you have John talking about in the beginning, and then you have Christ working throughout all this time in, in his ministry, in his life, death, and resurrection. And then we're told in Hebrews that he has rested in the same way that God rested at the end of creation, at the end of the Christian week. So what does all this mean? It means that salvation is not through striving, nor is it through our resting. 
Salvation is through God's work and God's rest. God enters his rest and God completes his work in order that we may join him in that rest. Christ's work in his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and rest means salvation for us. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. So our salvation is something we must be diligent to enter through faithful obedience, and yet that salvation is only possible through the work and rest of Christ. So, to wrap it up, even in the first chapter of the Bible, we see this dramatic cosmic dance which choreographs redemptive history to us. Creation, rest, old world, new worlds, lesser lights, greater lights, old covenants, new covenants, investments of God's firelight into celestial bodies, which anticipates God's investment of his firelight into humanity who are made in his image and their dominion over the earth. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the earth is slowly being made into the likeness of heaven. There really is no one like God. He is a God like no other. And we can confidently say with the psalmist, how great are your works, O Lord. How profound are your thoughts. Let's pray. When God created the world, he did so out of no necessity to himself. He didn't need to create. He did so because it brought him pleasure. It was out of the good pleasure of his will that he decided to create as opposed to not create. His existence was complete and satisfied and in its fullness prior to the foundation of the world, where he lived in glory with the Son and the Holy Spirit, the communion of perfect love and selflessness. We are created in that image, meaning we are made for community. Our God is a community. And so we are the most godlike when we are in community. God's existence essentially entails otherness and oneness at the same time. This is most clearly reflected in human marriages, but also reflected here in this meal. Marriage is a secular institution in the true sense of that word, meaning it isn't an eternal institution. Human marriages won't be part of the resurrected order, but the marriage of God's bride, ourselves, to God's Son, Jesus, will be part of the resurrected order. And this meal commemorates the formation of that union, the initiation of it. This meal is God's way of bringing us to himself into that divine community of sacrificial love. This meal is where the Creator God communes with his created image bearers. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for uh, giving us uh, your son, sacrificing yourself for us so that uh, we can be uh, resurrected and that your uh, wrath for our sinfulness would be satisfied on the cross. And uh, we praise you and we thank you for giving us these, um, these real uh, elements um, that uh, are real blessing uh, to us and that feed us and remind us of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The charge is this. You are made in the image of the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. So go out into the world bearing that image for the world to see and know and discover who it is you reflect. When kids argue with each other about whose dad can beat up whose dad, they intuitively grasp at the fundamental truths of the universe, that their Heavenly Father can beat up anybody, that He is the strongest and that He is the greatest, period. This is our God. This is who we look like, so go and exercise dominion over the earth your Father has made for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you.